Good morning. Esteemed President of the Institute, Sri Vivek Dev Roy, who will be Good, good morning, esteemed president of the institute, Sri Vivek Dev Roy, who will be joining soon, shortly. Uh, chairman of the ISI Council, Dr. Ashok Kumar Lahiri, Chief Statistician uh, and uh, and Chief Statistician of India, and Secretary, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Dr. G.P. Samanto. Distinguished guests, my colleagues and friends, I welcome you all the 91st Foundation Day of the Indian Statistical Institute. The journey of the ISI started under the leadership of Professor Prasantachand Mahalnubis, a great visionary. A statistical laboratory was set up in the erstwhile Presidency College sometimes around 1920. The Indian Statistical Institute was founded on December 17, 1931 in the same laboratory. On this auspicious occasion, to celebrate the 91st Foundation Day, we present before you an enriching program. I request the members of the ISI club to commence the inaugural song.
Thank you, ISI club member. A small announcement. Uh, all are requested to please keep their mobile phones on silent or switched off mode. Please. So may I now request our director, uh, Professor Shamamita Bandhavadhyay, to deliver the welcome address. Please, madam. As you know, there is a saying that when you want everything to work perfectly, things go wrong. So, although we've made advances in technology, there, there is a technical glitch and we would require two minutes of your time. We will take a break for two minutes uh, to get the technology, the technical aspects of this program working fine. Please excuse us. Sleep. Hmm. Is it working now? Wait, I'm going to Restart Restart Don't waste time, restart. Reclaim host value. Okay. Just stream. 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 
una que es por la una, otra que es por la otra. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot to the technical team. The journey that started on 17th December 1931. It has been a long path, winding, sometimes uphill, sometimes not so difficult, but almost always challenging and enjoyable. Having completed 90 years of its existence, Indian Statistical Institute is celebrating today its 91st Foundation Day. On this joyous occasion, we are honored by the presence of our Institute President, Shubhi Beg Dev Roy, who has not joined us yet, but is on his way, and the Chairman of the ISI Council, Dr. Ashok Lahiri. Although the Chief Statistician of India and the Secretary of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Dr. G.P. Shamunto, could not be present physically in ISI Kolkata, we are delighted that he will be able to join this event online. My special thanks to Dr. Shundeep Chatterjee, who has arrived, renowned neurosurgeon, and our very own Bhargavda for their gracious presence and participation in the events of the day. Thank you all very much for being here today in our moment of joy. This institute has over the years earned a reputation of attracting high quality talent and producing high quality research and excellent students. The honors and achievements that the Institute faculty members and students are bestowed with on a regular basis remain formidable. ISI was and continues to remain to a large extent a very niche institution. Nevertheless, with just about a decade away from its centenary, an introspection and a possible path readjustment uh, may be necessary in view of the new education policy in view of the changing expectations the country and the society has from the Institute, and in view of our inherent need to remain excellent, relevant, and in tune with, if possible, ahead of the times. We hope and wish that the deliberations that will happen today would help us define the path towards ISI at 100. On this path, let us be true to the mantra gan from the Rig Veda that we heard a while back. Sang achadvang, sang vadadvang, sang vo manansi janatam. Wishing, may, may we march forward with a common goal. May we be open-minded and work together in harmony. Wishing all of us the very best on the foundation day of the Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam for your uh, welcome address. Now, uh, we are going to uh, declare Vigilance Awareness Week uh, Competition Award, right? Which was recently held uh, in the Institute. So as a part of that, a essay competition uh, on Vigilance is the prerequisite of an autonomous educational institute was held. <clears throat> the certificates of the two winners of this competition will be awarded now. I request our uh, part-time uh, vigilance officer, Professor Povitra Boni, uh, please come up on the stage and hand over the certificates. Povitra, please. May I now request the winner and runner-up of the competition, Ms. Salini Singh and Mr. Prasunjit Das, to come up on the stage to receive the certificates. Salinishi. Prasenjit Das. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bonik. Uh, now, uh, we are move forward, going to start our spotlight presentations on creating the future ISI at 100 and beyond. 10 of our colleagues will share their viewpoints. So may I now request Professor Bhargav Bhattacharya to come up on the stage, please, and chair the session. 
our uh, senior research fellow sri samrit doshan will assist the session chair in managing the time so so let me take the privilege to introduce professor bhargav bhattacharya professor bhattacharya currently is a distinguished visiting professor of computer science and engineering at iit kharagpur prior to that he had been a faculty member of indian statistical institute kolkata for 35 years he has published more than 400 research papers and holds 10 us patent patents he is a fellow of indian national academy of engineering a fellow of the national academy of sciences india and fellow of itpl apart from his academic excellence research accolades and honors he also served the institute as a deputy director and the professor in charge of the computer and communication sciences division we love to call our call him bhargavda bhargavda over to you now please come okay thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this forum it's for great play it's my great pleasure uh, yes. to have to serve this great institute for more than 25 years so a very good morning to all distinguished guests and uh, we have uh, dr rashad lahiri with us uh, chairman of the isi council uh, sir vivek devra is joint president of the institute of joint later on uh, and i heard that uh, uh, dr jp samarth is a statistician who is also an alum alumnus of this institute we also join join online and our eminent and eminent liver surgeon uh, dr sandeep chatter is also here my all old friends the distinguished colleagues and students and all workers of this institute so today we are going to celebrate my first foundation day and as you know that uh, 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 it did, we are we are sitting in this auditorium, and this is this was opened in 2005 in, in the uh, when we celebrated the 75 platinum jubilee. So we are now uh, 10 years from now we'll be leading to uh, we'll be heading towards the centenary. We'll touch the centenary mark in 1931. Uh, 2031. So when we celebrate a, a day like this, it's a very auspicious day. So we have two things. One is so we recollect we revisit our past uh, to recollect uh, the contributions of great individuals on the shoulder this institute has grown and earned his reputation and legacy and we reassess ourselves now sitting at this venture so that we explore new opportunities in the future how we should tune ourselves so that we can go ahead with and keep shining so before i start uh, this uh, this part like presentation let me just share with Just three anecdotes highlighting our achievements uh, of Indian statistical institute in various disciplines. The first one is related to computer science. So you know there is a town called Mountain View in, in the Silicon Valley, California. So this is famous for because it uh, the Google headquarters is situated there, and there is also a computer science museum there. So if you walk into that museum, there is a commemorative plaque on display. It reads. in the memory of somarendra kumar mitra who designed and built the india's first computer at rsi kolkata in 1954 and i'm sure very few of us are aware of this achievement my second uh, the the anecdote is from this concern in statistics so you, you are all familiar with the master hard of this mars mission uh, which is conducted by nasa For more than a decade, and very recently in 2020, uh, the Mars Perseverance uh, uh, rover that was sent to Mars and for studying ancient life and for Mars exploration. So in the in the Mars robot, you know, and there are thousands of lines of software codes are being run, and 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 major component of that code comprises what is called particle filter. Which is based on the uh, Sierra Law and Blackwell's contributions on on, on particle filter. 
Okay. And today you have, you, have, you, you must have heard of we are immersed in what is called artificial intelligence and data sciences. And if you look into the expanding horizon of data science, so it, it is centered around the single concept, which is statistics. So the so the sapling which was planted by Professor Mahalan 90 years ago in a small room of the presidency college. So it has impacted the whole work significantly. So we said that, uh, let me, and so, uh, uh, and today we have a spotlight presentation, we have 10 distinguished speakers who have, who have served this institute, who are associated with this institute for many years, and they understand the vibes and the goals of the institute. So let me first uh, invite the youngest member of the spotlight presentation, Mr. Anis. Uh, Mr. Pons Parvez. So he is a, a he is an alumni. He, he, he finished his B step from this institute in 2020, and currently he is an A star student, and he will be finishing in uh, in the next semester. And incidentally, he qualified both for IIT and IAS to Bangalore admission, but he declined those two offers and joined ISR to pursue his Thank you, sir. Dear all, a uh, very warm good morning to all of you. I am Anish Parvez, a student of MSTAT final year. And the topic for the day today is creating the future, ISI at the rate 100 and beyond. Since its prenatal stage, the events that led to the establishment of ISI have been driven quotes, either in the pursuit of knowledge or promotion of human welfare, unquote, as the purpose of statistical learning should be. In the prenatal times, one of the, of the many phenomenal works by our founding forefather, Sir P.C. Mahalanobis, was a statistical investigation of the Urisa flood. A committee of engineers suggested that increasing the height of the embankment as they believed that the riverbed has risen. However, the statistical investigations showed no such change has occurred in the riverbed, indicating that the construction of dams in the upper reaches for flood control. This was found to be indeed the case, and years later, this formed the foundation of the Hirakun Dam. Such research activities undertaken in the 1920s served as the nutrition in its prenatal stage, thus shaping the vision of ISI. Attending statistical inquiries of various kinds from all over India has been a major work of the Institute for a long time. Among others, the large scale survey of jute crops in Bengal hold a special place as it opened the domain of large scale sample survey, a domain which brought both theoretical and practical accolades to the ISIs. ISI contribution to the nation was enshrined in the Indian, Inst Indian Statistical Institute Act of 1959, which designated ISI as Institute of National Importance. The point which I make, want to make here is that this accolade was a realization of the vision of ISI along with dynamic implementation strategies of those times. For an organization to battle the test of time, it calls for path adjustments from time to time and innovative strategies which adopt to the changing times. Another instance which depicts the vision was setting up of different units in the 1950s and the commencement of the degree programs we started in 1961, whose benefits the world has seen. From the perspective of a student, I believe that the changing scenarios of present calls for newer strategies. An implementation lesson to learn from the ISI history is that along with intellect, extensive collaboration among researchers and foreign visitors were pivotal in its growth. Nowadays, the nature of statistical problems is rapidly changing. The problems emerging in different domains are becoming, becoming increasingly complex and which calls for extensive interdisciplinary research. By increasing collaboration with researchers around the globe working in different fields would help us contribute more to the frontiers of the research. Another aspect of problem nowadays is that they require theory and extensive computation to go hand in hand. In such changed times, Increasing computation, ex computational exposure of students would prepare them well to tackle real life challenges better. 
Yet another aspect which should be taken care of while formulating the future policies is growing the outreach of institute among higher school, high school students across India. Apart from popularizing the brand, a revision of statistic syllabus at the central level for high schools would might help us to might help students grow passion for statistics. We would positively benefit from this diversity in, in uh, from the diversity and this passion. Finally, I would conclude that whatever course we take in future, it is important that one does not forget the rich heritage of ISI. Among other things, this helps to create a sense of belongingness to the ISI community. This sense propels the ones associated with ISI to give back to the community from which ISI would surely benefit. Thank you. Uh, so may I now invite uh, our second speaker, uh, Professor Priti Parakar, to be here. So maybe uh, we'll join later. Uh, so ne next I invite uh, Professor Ramsar Bandhapatma, who is Professor of uh, Statmat and representing the Statmat division. Honorable President of Indian Statistical Institute Society, Sri Vivek Dev Roy, welcome, sir. Honorable Chairman of ISI Council, Dr. Ashok Lahiri. Honorable Secretary, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation and Chief Statistician of India, Dr. Govinda Shamanto. Respected Madam Director, Professor Shangamitra Bandhapadhyay, Respected Deputy Director, Professor Dipti Prashad Mukhopadhyay, Respected Dean of Studies, Professor Devashish Shen Gupto, my fellow speakers, colleagues, students, friends, and guests, and Respected Chairman Sir, Professor Bhargav Bhattacharya. Sir, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to stand before you to address this August audience today on the 91st Foundation Day of Indian Statistical Institute. I thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Some 90 years back, on a similar December day, some stalwarts with blessings of even greater stalwarts started this great institute. They started the institute by gathering and disseminating the knowledge of a then new science, statistics, a science that almost was unheard of in various parts of the world, including our country. But the stalwarts made the goal of the Institute to study this new science, statistics. They also quickly understood that the new science is omnipresent and has manifold of existence. Unity in diversity, sir, has beautiful meaning in this land. The founders realized that when it comes to science, unity in diversity has yet another example through this that then new science statistics. It was thus taken as the motto of this institute. The institute since then nurtured the diversity in its scientific works. It welcomed researchers from various disciplines of natural, social, and mathematical sciences. The individual identities of all the scientific thoughts were carefully maintained in the Institute, yet the unique thread 
which united all of them together was statistics. Time, sir, as we all know, heals, but it can also be very unforgiving and can weaken even the strongest foundations. 90 years is a long time. ISI, even though started with a very firm and phenomenal foundation, today I must admit with great concern that its foundation has perhaps weakened. From a leader in all aspects, we have come to a time when we are desperate to follow others. Every now and then in our daily work, in our every policy making, in our every academic and administrative thoughts, we often now ask, what happens here? What happens there? There is nothing wrong in knowing what happens in other similar places. But when we feel the compulsion of comparing ourselves at every step, it then unfortunately becomes a burden, a burden of a follower. Such burden gathered over even a less than a decade time can weaken very strong foundations created over several decades. The unique thread, sir, is no more as tightly fastened in the Institute as it perhaps desired. Some are even thinking of gathering the whole thread and making it in a tight ball and leaving it in one small corner, which will apparently look very good, perhaps as a memento from the past. Some are saying, let the thread be loosely tied. It is not giving space for others to, others to grow in the Institute. Once again, there is no harm in having good growth of the various knowledge which we are nurtured in this Institute. In fact, it is more than welcome, but the unique thread must be tied properly as it never harms any growth, it only nurtured them more and give them better strength together. It also must be done with a firm conviction so that the unity is strengthened. The uniqueness of us is our identity. And as we all know, losing identity is terrible nowadays, sir. Creating the future, ISI at 100 and beyond, this is the topic of discussion today. It is my belief, sir, that the future will only be determined by us and with our hope and determination. As the great poet wrote, that even at the time of great darkness, we must not lose hope. We don't need any arms, sir. As I believe we have many within us. We thus, sir, do not need to reimagine the Institute, reinvent it, or reposition ourselves in the Institute. What we do need for ISI at 100 is rethinking, reopening, and renovating ourselves. We need a renaissance in various parts of the world, in the West as well as in the Far East, statistics is going through a renaissance. It is time for us to do the renaissance in this institute also. We must rethink of our traditional ideals. We must reopen ourselves to all scientific ideas and renovate ourselves as a more matured an able scientific institute. It is time that we take this step in the next 10 years. Let us look at the emblem of the Institute, sir. Let us remind ourselves that we can grow within like a big and strong and a great banyan tree. ISI 100 should be our emblem and our motto. The banyan tree of statistics must once again create a conducive ecosystem 
to unite all sciences, keeping all their diversities. Thank you, sir. Thank you, for your social realism. Let me know by Professor Sora Ghosh. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bhattacharya uh, and uh, the president of the Indian Statistical Institute Society, the chairman. Okay, is this okay? Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. So uh, the president of ISI Society, uh, the chairman, uh, respected uh, di director, deputy director, uh, my fellow speakers and uh, the audience in general. So, uh, you know, I must say that I did not know uh, when I would be asked to speak. It's always good to be in the beginning of the sequence because there's always this apprehension that you might feel that you're talking and it might be very cliched if you're talking uh, later on. So. Let me start by saying uh, that we need to understand our past and how this institute was created, as my uh, previous speaker spoke. But what I would like to highlight is a part of the speech that was uh, delivered by uh, Professor J.B.S. Holden on the inaugural day of the BSTAT program uh, on 16th August 1960. And uh, he gave a pretty long speech, but uh, he was talking about teaching uh, subjects uh, in scientific disciplines other than what was uh, called uh, hardcore statistics. And he said, it is true that our graduates will be unable to pass a BSc examination in zoology, botany, or physiology in any Indian university or its equivalent in any British one. It is also true that by the third practical exercise in the course, which I have designed, which is very interesting that he had designed, he was the main architect. He was a botanist by training. He was the main architect of a course, which was primarily quantitative in nature. Uh, that our students will be doing something which is not part of any biological course in India and is a part of very few elsewhere, a systematic study of variation in plants and animals. Later, I hope they will do a good deal more uh, quantity biology of various kinds. It is most unlikely that a gold medalist of an Indian university in any of the biological sciences would secure a 50% mark in a biology examination. Now, what probably Holden said, he goes on to say many other things, that the fallacy probably remains in our basic education system, the compartmentalization of uh, different uh, disciplines in our school education where, you know, people who are told probably they are uh, guided that way that those who choose a biological course must give up the study of mathematics and vice versa. Uh, probably this is a biggest impediment to the development of science. And uh, that is what I would like to highlight uh, that when this institute was set up, of course, that was with a vision as was pointed out. Uh, for integrating to bringing in to unify the various sciences through statistics. And while the Institute has undergone a lot of metamorphosis over the years, some of course in tune with the changes of priorities of scientific research, uh, the main purpose of the change was of course to adopt to uh, emerging scientific challenges uh, centering around statistics, but probably without deviating from the main mandate uh, of uh, methodological development of quantitative sciences. I'm not saying I'm just interpreting statistics in a broader sense and uh, carrying out novel applications of such methodologies in uh, addressing quantitative questions 
in uh, biological, social, and physical sciences. Now, of course, things have changed. It is not that statistics has only changed. There's been parallel development of science as well. And uh, with the advent of technology, what has happened is this huge uh, uh, generation of high throughput data, uh, voluminous data, which has raised various different sort of challenges today. So the challenges that existed probably when this, uh, initially the BSTAT course was set up and the challenges now are slightly different. Now, of course, we need to integrate, uh, that was the motto of the Institute, we need to integrate the various scientific fields. And uh, the USP of this Institute is to do it through statistics. Now, of course, the questions will not arise suddenly. These questions in other scientific disciplines would give rise to newer hypotheses, which has to be acknowledged that it is not statistics that we develop methods in statistics and then try to find out whether there is an application in the various uh, other fields or not, or but rather to start with, and that is what Pro Professor Malnovich did, to start with empirical findings and find out that where things are going wrong. And that is probably how science has developed to find out shortcomings of existing technology of existing methodology and to see how quantitative uh, analysis can bring in more precision. Now, of course, there's been this ever diminishing line separating different uh, scientific disciplines. And this, of course, as uh, our first uh, our, our student said that uh, th there's increasing need for interdisciplinary research. Now that research has to be somewhat, uh, which is reciprocal. So it cannot be that one is a dominant partner over the other. But that doesn't mean that uh, we lose focus of the Institute. If we, this was, this Institute was never set up with an university framework in mind where there'd be fundamental development of all disciplines uh, but with the idea that it is, there would be a specific sort of uh, sort of research where the quantitative questions are uh, the things that we would be focusing on. And that is where statistics and nowadays, of course, as we see computations play a big role. Uh, I would like to end on two different notes. One is that other than the research and the academic part, of course, the current COVID pandemic, uh, and to excuse my language, has caught particularly this institute with our pants down. And that is because probably we were not ready with the technology that was required for what we call the online solutions. Probably that was a problem throughout India, uh, but more so uh, I would point out in this institute, uh, because uh, of the lack of the technical know-how. And this is something probably we should be careful about when we go to the hundredth year, that we should be ready for such sort of things. Of course, no one anticipates or you know, brings in this sort of uh, belief that there would be pandemics, but we now know we should be knowing from uh, lessons and that's what statistic tells us to look at the data. By virtue of being the current editor of Shonka, let me take this privilege of quoting Rabindranath in one of the initial volumes of Shonka, where he said that we believe any fact to be true because of a harmony, a rhythm in reason, the process of which is analyzable by the logic of mathematics. And what I would end with is probably slightly a revolutionary sort of a statement that probably when we look at the 100th year, we should be looking into Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Uh, for those who do not know, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician by training. And the Alice in Wonderland is often considered a mathematical satire, uh, which essentially uh, dealt with explaining very subtle concepts in this prob probably case, uh, uh, geometry, uh, which is, uh, evidently there in, uh, if you read Alice in Wonderland, uh, to make it much more meaningful to the general mass. Thank you.
Yes, this is unmute. Respected, I mean, audible. Respected President of ISI, uh, Sri Vivek Debroy, uh, respected Chairman of uh, ISI Council, Dr. Lahiri, uh, respected Director, Professor Shangumitra Bandopadhyay, respected uh, Deputy Director, Professor Dipti Prashad Mukherjee, respected Dean, Professor Shenguptu, and respected Moderator, Professor Bhattacharya, and our all respected dignitaries and distinguished guests, and guests present, uh, present here. So I have been asked by my uh, guardian professor in charge, Professor Ridul Nondi, to say something in this on this uh, August gathering, mm -hmm. on this uh, special day of ISI, our uh, foundation day. So my job is uh, I was not very sure how, how how much to cover in four minutes, but it has I I did, I did prepare something which I am now reading out from. My job is, has been made slightly less difficult by what uh, Professor Antar Bandopadhyay and Shourab Ghosh, uh, they said. Uh, so uh, I, shall, I shall try to present a brief uh, backdrop against which we are having this discussion. What they have stated, basically I shared their view that ISA was, uh, the, the was instituted with a specific goal. Meanwhile, our subject has changed. The priorities have been somewhat modified. So uh, I was looking into some literature. In recent times, there have been two important, uh, important books have come out. One book is by uh, one of the most respected statisticians, Bradley Efron. The book, title of the book is Computer Age Statistical Inference, Algorithms, Evidence, and Data Science. I repeat the title. Computer Age Statistical Inference, Algorithms, Evidence, and Data Science. And the other book is by another very respected statistician, David Spiegelhalter of United Kingdom. Uh, he's a very, uh, he's a relative fellow also. His book is called uh, Art of Statistics, Learning from Data. So how, how one can learn from data. So basically, basically they are trying to put forward, I mean, in, in Spiegelhalter's book, the, he's trying to put forth the view that two things, first of all, in view of data science, the current, uh, I should say current, uh, I mean, one of the trends in in the in the, in the academics and industry, uh, basically, is trying to put forth that we have to learn from data, and he is uh, emphasizing the role of proper statistics training in the context in this context. So I shall I shall present the back, backdrop based on what Professor Efron has written. So he has first of all written what he has done in his book. He has presented. In, I'm sorry. Excuse me. He has presented. The journey of statistics in the 20th century through a triangle. The three vertices of the triangle are what he is calling application, mathematics, and computation, and try to locate what are the major achievements of statistics in 20th century in relation to those vertices. I had a presentation, but fortunately, uh, this kind of uh, this uh, time is short. So he is saying whether or then he is going on to say toward the end of this. This is the last actually the last. This is what I'm going to present before this audience. That a cohesive inferential theory. I repeat that this book is about computer and statistical inference. Look at the title carefully. A cohesive inferential theory was forged in the first half of the, of the 20th century, but unity came at the price of an inwardly focused discipline of reduced practical utility. In the century second half, electronic computation unleashed a vast expansion of useful and much used statistical methodology. Expansion accelerated it at the turn of the millennium, further increasing the reach of statistical thinking, but now at the price of intellectual cohesion. It is tempting but risky to speculate on the future of statistics. What will be mathematics application computation diagram look like? Say 25 years from now, this book appeared in 20, 2016. The appetite for, step, appetite for statistical analysis seems to be always increasing, both from science and from society in general. Data science has blossomed in response, but so has the traditional wing of the field. The data analytic initiative represented in the diagram by, we can skip that, but, and in actuality not. A hopeful scenario for the future is one of increasing overlap that puts data science on a solid footing 
while leading to a broader general formulation of statistical inference. So this is what Efron ends his book with. So we can expect that our institute will take into account the global trend of statistics and also see what the national interests are. And also in the process while formulating such policy, take into account what we have achieved by good, what we could not. So this is my humble presentation before the gathering. Thank you very much. Uh, our respected president of ISI, Sri Vivek Devra, uh, our chairman of the council, Should I speak into this? Is the caller mic working? Okay. Okay. Let, let me speak into this mic. Um, maybe. Yeah. If this works, does it work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, respected. President of the uh, uh, ISI General Body, Sri Vivek Devra, Chairman of the Council, uh, Professor Ashok Lahedi, uh, our respected guest, Dr. Shandip Chatterjee, respected director, deputy director, my teacher, Professor Bhagav Bhattacharya, my co co workers, students, ladies and gentlemen. It seems like only the other day that I joined this institute as a student fresh out of school. Our seniors never lost an opportunity to point out that we just missed the grand feast that, are, that was organized as a part of the golden jubilee celebration of the Institute. Here I am, nearly 40 years later, talking about what we should expect or like to see when the Institute crosses the century landmark. My training in this institute almost impulsively raises questions about definitions of terms. What do we mean by Indian Statistical Institute? The question is very similar uh, to the one people often uh, debate about what exactly does represent a nation, say India. Of course, it represents many things. To me, the most important part that the institute represents is what it produces a body of scientific research, and a group of trained people. The training of the students involves not just definitions, lemmas, and theorems. Ingrained in all the teaching is certain value system and ethos that the institute represents. When I was a student, smoking was a social taboo rather than health hazard. It is considered now. Yet. Smoking was allowed for students in the exam halls, sometimes even in the classrooms. There were teachers who came to the classes wearing shorts. Respect for the teachers was earned naturally and felt in the heart. The students, and including me, we learned an important lesson. Respect is not just for the position, it's to be earned. Another important lesson that was learned that asking questions was the most natural thing. It did not show disrespect. So over a cup of tea, we, the students, teachers, research scholars, non-faculty workers, we discussed everything from politics to films or a problem in measure theory maybe. I'm not sure what it is now, but during the, my student days, the 100 rupees that we received as stipend was a symbol of our self-respect. Many students added some more money 
by giving private tuitions and didn't take money from parents. While some of us, it was about, it was a part of growing up for a significant number of students, it was a necessity. I know a large number of alumni who could not have continued their studies, but for this financial help. And from my personal experience, I know there are such students even today. Another part of this institute was you could approach any faculty member with your doubts, even if they were not teaching you in the class. Uh, education was free, both in terms of money and boundaries. I hope the current students feel the same. In terms of research findings, one quality that stands out is that the Institute has been pioneer in multiple areas. Of course, Professor Bhattacharya mentioned about the mention of Shamarindra Kumar Mitra. And I, I can tell you that the, computer, the MTech in computer science program that the Institute runs today is one of the oldest in the, is probably the oldest in the country. And it's unique in its nature still. So how have we performed? Like all good time series data, our performance has a trend, seasonal fluctuations, slightly cyclic variations, and local errors. While change is inevitable, one thing I would like the Institute to preserve is the culture of asking questions. That is the path to knowledge. And promote the culture of diversity, which is part of our motto. So why do I want to see this institute beyond 100? Well, in Bengal, we cannot help taking help from Tagore. In his words, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, free beyond the boundaries of caste, gender, regionality, political views, personal preferences, and economic inequalities. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Bhargavikam Bhattacharya, the moderator of the particular <coughs> topics. Respected our president of the institute, Sir Vivek Debray, respected Dr. Ashok Kumar Lahiri, chairman of the Council of ISI, respected Dr. G.P. Samantha, chief statistician of India. Respected Professor Sangavitra Bandhavadda, our director of the institute. Respected gentlemen, dignitaries, and our beloved workers of the institute. Uh, actually, the moderator of the particular subject has given the opportunity to within the limit of four minutes. But it is not possible to within this limit of time. Although I want to speak about the Foundation Day, 91th Foundation Day of the Institute. The origin of the India Statistical Institute 
can be traced to the early statistical work of Professor P.C. Monolovis on biometry, meteorology, and anthropometry. Later, a few part-time assistants and a group of young research workers had formed the nucleus of ISI in its humble beginning in 1931 in the labor statistical laboratory, which was located in the presidency college, Kolkata. In 2031, ISI will celebrate with glory its illustrious journey of 100 years to have semblance with it past decide theoretical research and teaching, ISI should lay emphasis on giving advice to various government departments, emphasize on um, departments, industries in both private and public sectors and scientific institution based on the objectivity that emerged from application of statistical sciences. The Institute had been intimately connected with training and projects from government departments and also from private firms. ISI should continue to do a very large volume of the same kind of projects of mixture of both public and private initiative. The joy of solving a practical problem should be shared equally by the faculties, workers, and students for further inspiration. In this context, I must mention that since at present, I am posted in the SQC and OR division the institute work has been highly appreciated in the industrial units which have been availed of its services. But there is no room for complacency since the outrage of various government departments, industries, and scientific organizations has not yet developed to anywhere near the requirements of this vast country, even though it can never be denied that the success achieved by ISI so far has been quite impressive. It would be impossible to understand the way of Prasantichanda Marnabis built the ISI and ran it if one does not take account of the point that for him, the institute was not just a means of prom promoting research in statistics or knowledge in general. It was for him also a means of employment creation. An unemployed person is in way, any way, consuming to survive. If that person is made to work, there would be some increased production, however little, and therefore giving employment can only increase production. TCM did not have towards the non-elite semi-educated people a superior attitude, which is so common among the elite academicians of today. Professor Monolivis did not like terms of hierarchy, to him, everyone was a worker known not by his designation, but by his role number. Let's place to maintain his legacy and side by side, by side adopt the requirement of modernity in a judicious manner. The likes of Monolabis and SN both believe that modernity means a philosophy that guides the society to the path of progress, not for a handful, but for the teeming millions often suffering from abject poverty. Thus, about eight years ago, the feminist in Bengal became the subject of his research in opposition to the colonial policies looting and pauperizing the country of the, for the benefit of a handful of British industrialists. Today, when we find powerful section of the government similarly dancing to the tune of the handful of capitalists trying to impose a so-called new education policy that actually is the Jamindari education system where all the Propertied are to get the benefit of education. We need a monologist, a Satyan boss, to lead us courageously in a battle of resistance. ISI 100 will provide us with such leadership. We are hopeful and confident since we know that history creates leadership and leaders create history in turn. Last but not the least, it is true that ISI had a glorious past and it has a glorious future within the democratic fabric if we persist in our willpower to challenge any obstacle. Thank you to all. Thank you.
So, am I audible? Respected uh, President Sri Bibek Dev Roy, Chairman Dr. Ashok Lahiri, Secretary must be Dr. G.P. Shamanto, uh, Guest of Honor Dr. Chatterjee, our Director Professor Shangamitra Vandapadhyay, Deputy Director. Ladies and gentlemen, so time is very short. Only four minutes have been given to each speaker in this session. So in order to minimize the deviation between the planned arrangement and what I'll be speaking, I have written down certain points. So that's, how, that's what I will be just reading out. ISI will celebrate its 100th year in 2031. ISI had a gl glorious past and continues to have areas of excellence, no doubt about that. But what is the challenge? The challenge is to sustain and enhance excellence. Let me repeat, to sustain and enhance excellence. The question is how? The fourth review committee has recommended structures, policies, and resources that could be enabling factors for ISI to attain higher levels of excellence and sustain it. Sustain it. The question is of achieving and sustaining great eminence. The question is, does ISI still consider itself a distinguished inheritor of Mohalanubish legacy? But one should not live in the memories of the past alone. Excellency is a journey and not a destination. Moreover, it is a collective journey by the ISI faculty, ISI staff and ISI students together. The collective dream, collective vision, collective mission and collective effort will help ISI to maintain its distinction. ISI should not only put its effort for blue sky abstract theoretical research alone, the benefits of theoretical research of today will percolate much later, much later to the people at large or to the nation as such. So theoretical research is necessary, but not sufficient to make ISIS contribution failed by various government bodies, including Niti Ayo. So national level service may be provided by ISI for the palpable benefit of the country. And this may be in the areas of, these are some demonstra dem demonstrative examples, not exhaustive in nature. Big data analysis, SPC, statistical process control in say FCI go downs, preventive man predictive maintenance of army assets, automation of court procedures, for increasing efficiency and productivity of Indian courts and for reducing delays. Even simple steps here can have noticeable impact in reducing delays and huge number of pending cases. Then statistical analysis of data collected by other government funded research institutes to extract maximum benefit in terms of statistical surveys, estimation, inference, improvement through statistical experimentation and holding the gain by introducing appropriate statistical process control. The problems must not be misclassified. That is also very important thing. Say estimation problem should not be, should be considered properly. A control part problem, statistical process control problem should not be conceived as an estimation problem. 
that also happens many a time. It may be worthwhile to remember the way statistics was defined by Professor Mohalanovic as a key technology. He further defined that statistics is the universal tool of inductive inference, research in natural and social sciences, and technological applications. Statistics, therefore, must have purpose either in the pursuit of knowledge or in promotion of human welfare. Very important thing. As far as ISI's role as a distinguished inheritor of Mohalanabish legacy is concerned, the following must be noted. Contributions are immense for national development. ISI continues to play a major role in many policy-making exercises of the government. It produces excellently trained human resources who join academia and stroke our industry and stroke our government. Some of them are placed in some of the top institutes in the world and in the country. Thus, it becomes all the more important for the government to ensure the well-being of this internationally reputed institution beyond just helping it to survive by enhancing the grant in aid. ISI had a glorious past, it has a glorious present, and it will continue to have a glorious future as well. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Sri Vivek Debroy, Honorable President, ISI. Sri Dr. Ashok Lahiri, Honorable Chairman, in the ISI Council, Dr. G.P. Shamanto, Honorable Secretary Mosby and Chief Statistician, Professor Songamitra Bandhavadhyay, Director, Indian Statistical Institute, Deputy Director, Dr. Professor Dipti Boshad Mukherjee, our colleagues, guest, and Dr. Sundeep Chatterjee, guest of honor. Today, we are celebrating the 91st Foundation Day of our beloved institute. At the outset, we would like to express our deep respect to our great founder, Professor Prashanta Chandra Mohanadovich, who dreamt of and founded this institute, ISI, which paved the way of developing the national statistical framework that contributed to policy formulation for a prosperous India. The very first line that adorns the memorandum of association of our institute declares, the objective of the institute said be to promote the study and dissemination of knowledge of statistics to develop statistical theory and methods and their use in research and practical applications generally. With special reference to problems of planning of national development and social welfare. We are proud to have someone as our founder who valued the work towards attaining the declared goal all through his life. We are confident that the remarkable contribution this institute has made over the years for national development would set the right tune for introspection and reassure the milestone of the future. Like the huge banyan tree in the emblem of the institute, this institute had nurtured subjects other than statistics and mathematics with equal care and earnestness. And then even outside the scope of effort, academics, he dreamt of an institute that would be complete and self-sufficient in all respect and equipped it with various units and departments. But nowadays, we are gradually departing from his dream. Instead, there is an increasing tendency to refute the social responsibility and welfare approach on one hand and virtual rejection of the self-sufficiency aimed policies on the other hand. Now we are relying more and more on hired or outsourced services with respect to both man and technology. For a great visionary who dreamt of developing ISI in terms of national interest and social welfare for someone 
who was always desperate to develop even the most unskilled worker of his institute to a skilled wonder. This would have been a painful picture to see. Maharanavis had deep rooted contracts with all the technological adva technologically advanced countries of the, his time, including both USA and USSR, and yet was never afraid to employ a large pool of workers in contrast to what we have often hear today that such an investment on manpower is bad for an organization's health. He was quite modern in understanding the country's problem beyond shallow short-term perspectives that mostly reflect the class interests of a handful of highly privileged section of society who always want to reduce government expenditure in order to get its benefit themselves. His way of functioning was based on deep-rooted trust, confidence, and assurance. And as an ardent supporter of collective action, he advocated, in principle, the need of repeated interaction and introspection, keeping the honesty of purpose in mind. But we are hopeful, hopeful and confident to restoring the glory and tradition of ISI and coming back to the right track in which this great visionary tried to develop this institute. This, we believe, can achieve through incessant discussion between the ISI authority and the government through our nodal ministry, in which active participation of the workers' organization, that is ISIW, will be very important. ISI, in its own right, has earned national and international reputation all these years for its eventful journey. And this is the time to reflect the ground reality and recognize the real contribution the public-funded institute has made over the years, albeit the patronage of the government of India. At this juncture, a collective effort from all of us is earnestly needed to protect our autonomy and democratic structure, which a premium institute like ISI always deserves. We are confident that the welfare activities, which were initiated by Professor Mohanavis for the workers and students, should be continued and academic excellence will be maintained at the same time the dream of professor to spread ISI in all over this country will be materialized in 100 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So, distinguished uh, dignitaries and honorable audience, uh, please note that I am not here uh, speaking on behalf of the Social Science Division. I have just come uh, as a member of the Social Science Division. Well, we are talking about the future of ISI 10 years hence. And I think uh, if you talk about his this future, you should uh, talk about the history of the Institute a little bit, as well as for the subject. Unfortunately, we also hear that the lesson from history is that no one takes lesson from history. But nevertheless, let me take some examples from the social science history. Let me take you back to 1857 and talk about Ernest Engel. He was probably the first economist to use data to analyze a social science problem. The question was very important. The, imp the question was essentially whether the benefits of the industrial revolution, now you know that is largely was funded by this uh, colonial India whether the benefits could be actually negated by a population expression that was actually prop uh, propounded by Malthus. Now, Engel came up with some ingenious analysis. Now we know that as Engel curves, and actually posed an alternative that it is not that easy way out. Coming back to 
1906, Wilfredo Pareto, once again, he was another person who actually dealt with data to analyze social problems. He looked at income distributions of different countries at different points of time, found there some natural law in that. What was the question? The question was very important once again, that whether the state or the governance or the policy has any implication on reducing inequality. So that this was a very challenging question. Let me give you another example. Vasily Leontief, we all know, he is famous about for his input-output model. He was the first economist to use matrix as a representation of economy. And then you may be knowing, knowing that his algorithm, that the way he actually dealt with that uh, analysis of economy, this algorithm is now being used. It is called the precursor of the Google page rank algorithm. Similar thing. So this was in 1949. Let me take you 10 years forward. 1960, our own Prashant Mahalanamish produced a novel technique. He called that the fractile graphical analysis. What was he doing? He was trying to analyze Indian National Sample Survey data. And then now it is acknowledged that this fractile graphical analysis he, I should say, invented is acknowledged as the, one of the earliest and perhaps the first work on non-parametric regression and subsampling. So therefore, what all these examples, there may be selection bias in these examples, but there is a commonality also. So the commonality is that a successful or a seminal scientific research in social science at least has a very clear trajectory. What was the trajectory? That it starts with a asking a very relevant question that is of, of primary importance. When you have decided on the question, you have to test the question, the validity of the questions in the light of your evidence and data. Once you have, you are sure that you have some evidence regarding analyzing your question, you now have a deep dive with statistical analysis of the question and look at data more intensely. And all these results into a finally come up with some innovation, either in a statistical tool or model. So, since we are discussing once again future 10 years hence, so what should be the lesson? I think our lesson should be that <clears throat> given this, our social science ecosystem should encourage primarily out of box research and encourage taking risk in research and not do the stereotypes. It should give priority to evidence over theoretical modeling, it should realize, we should realize that every societies are inherently different. And therefore, we need a customized analysis of our own <clears throat> nation. And we should have a fresh inquiry into the wealth of Indian nation. We should discourage the idea of manufacturing consent. That means we should not allow research quality to be judged by a democratic fashion. So we should be nurturing the art of asking questions. Many people have said that. I believe that solutions will always eventually be found, whatever be the problem, if the problem is correctly posed. But most often we are not asking the right question. Thank you. So first of all, I let, let me thank all the spotlight speakers for sharing their wisdom with us. And since we are running short of time, we are not going to continue any question and answer session. So in brief, what, what it turns out that we have talked about our bright, our glorious past, we should, we should maintain our excellence in, in just today and also in the future. We should, we should handle it. We should, we should put forward for applying newer abilities and newer opportunities for statistics at the same time maintaining our original threat. Dignity and diversity, 
at the, at the same time to protecting the autonomy and 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 the and the, and the, and the, and the freedom of thought which is pursued in, in this atmosphere in that sense. Thank you so much for your participation and, and for your enthusiastic thoughts. Thank you, Bhargav, for your uh, chairing the session. Please wait. So, we have enjoyed very much this session. May I now call uh, Shucheta Da, uh, our senior research fellow, to felicitate Bhargav. Please, Shucheta. Yes. Thank you, Suchadha. We now move on to our next session. Since March 2020, we are passing through a difficult time. Pandemic has touched our life in one way or other ways. Was there anything that we have learned from this difficult time? I would now uh, like to introduce our distinguished invite, invited speaker, the leading neuro, neurosurgeon of this country, Dr. Shondip Chatterjee. Professor and head of the department, neurosurgery, Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences, and academic head, neurosurgery, Park Lee, Kolkata. He will be delivering his talk, lessons learned from the pandemic. I invite Dr. Chatterjee on stage and request him to deliver the, his talk. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Honorable President of ISI, Honorable Chairman of the ISI Council, Honorable Director of the ISI, dignitaries assembled here, students, staff, friends. It gives me great pleasure, and indeed I treat it as an honor to be able to share with you this joyous occasion of the 91st birthday, a historic day, in the life of an historic institution. I am well aware that no form of statistical surveillance can put me on the same level of scientific significance as some of the people assembled in this auditorium. And since as a professor of neurosurgery, I will confess my knowledge of statistics can be written behind a minibus ticket, I have inform the director, I would rather talk to you about lessons that I, you, the human race as a whole, has learned from this terrible pandemic that we're still passing through. And I'm going to talk to you for the next 10 minutes by my stopwatch on lessons that we've learned as a member of the human race, lessons we have learned as a member of the scientific community, and lastly, lessons that we have learned as members of the medical profession. What have we learned as a human race? I think we've learned the three H's, humility, human values, and home. Humility is the most important thing that we've learned as members of the Homo sapiens species. When Professor Darwin told us some years ago that the Homo sapiens was the most evolved specimen to inhabit this planet, little did we think that a brainless blob of RNA would bring us as a race down onto our knees, as it has done for the last year and a half. The second age we've learned is human values. We have learned 
the most important value of life, we have learned to distinguish between our needs and our requirements. And we have understood that what we require is not what we actually need because we have learned over the last few months how we can do more with less. We no longer need to travel across the world to give lectures in different parts of this planet, thereby making more holes in the ozone layer than our race has created before. We no longer need to go to shop in expensive malls. We can do with very basic necessities as we've learned right across this planet in the last 18 months. And finally, the third age we've learned as a lesson as a human race is home. We've stayed at home, but most importantly, we've learned the value of home. Those that stay with us at home, who we had little time for before. And we've also learned how we can still do most of our work from our home. Perhaps that doesn't apply to neurosurgeons like myself. I wish we could operate on brains and spinal cords remotely. But I think still most of you have done a fair amount with your work from home. The second group that I'd like to talk to you about is lessons we've learned as a member of the scientific community. And I think as members of the scientific community, we've learned not the three H's, but the three D's. And the three D's I'd like to talk to you about are digitalization, discrimination, and dare I say, devastation. Digitalization, of course, is something that we've all learned, whether we liked it or not. Those of us with a lot of gray hair, those of us with no gray hair, we've all been reduced to being on the same level field in terms of digitalization, because that's been our only mode of communication with the rest of the world. How comforting it has been for me in a meeting on a digital platform to a safe, see a friend of mine from New York City. It is almost like shaking hands with him and embracing him in a public meeting. We've also learned strange things like giving lectures, wearing a, a coat and tie with shorts underneath because that was beyond the purview of the camera of the laptop. And somebody alluded to this, and it just reminded me of this. We've learned discrimination. The most important discrimination we've learned in the scientific community is to understand what should be our priority in a pandemic. As members of the scientific community, we've learned that we now have to do science, research, progress for mankind. Not what we need to do, but what we need to do for the rest of the race. And finally, devastation. We've learned to cope with devastation. I do not think there is anybody in the audience who cannot recall a dear one that we have lost to this deadly virus in the last few months. And for those of us that have had an opportunity, and I say opportunity, because it is in many ways a God sent opportunity. Those of us like myself that have had an opportunity to work in a COVID hospital and have seen those young bodies wrapped in black bags being dragged away by a corporation vehicle will never forget the value of life and will never cease to appreciate that what we have to do, we have to do today. And as I always tell my students, and somebody talked about this a short while ago, remember between lamentation about what we did not do yesterday and hope about what we will have to do in the future, there are the opportunities that lie today. First, grasp them with both your hands. And that is something we have learned in the pandemic. And finally, what have we learned as a medical professional, we've learned the three I's. I is something I tell my students never to use because it doesn't put us in the right frame in this world. 
because medical professionals should never say I, we should always say we. But the three I's we've learned, and I hate to tell you these three, but are the I for incompetence, the I for inadequacies, and the I for irrelevance. The first I we learned was incompetence. We had no clue what we should do. We had people delivering newspapers and we instructed people don't touch the newspapers, leave them out in the sun for 12 hours or 24 hours. So read yesterday's newspapers tomorrow. We covered ourselves with sanitizers. We now know that most people except the manufacturers of sanitizers have not benefited from their use because the virus travels only through the nose and the mouth. And what you do to your hands or your head or your feet makes little difference to whether you can get this disease or not. And therefore that was the incompetence that we had till we learned. There were those of us who were doing surgery, wearing those horrible protective equipments, the PPEs, which were not sterile. So on top of that, we were wearing another sterile gown, two masks, two headgears, two gloves. And if you had to do that and operate on a human brain for seven hours, at the end of that exercise, I can tell you, most of us were much more sick than our patients were. And we needed dehydration in the shower before we could even think of doing the next operation. We learned, of course, that that was useless. Of course, we learned our inadequacies. We learned how one in this very country of ours that we love so much and which has institutes like yours that we respect and honor so much. In this great country of yours, ours, we didn't have enough oxygen. Imagine a country that can send people to space, that can compete with the best in statistics, in IT, in science, not having enough oxygen to save our own people. That was what we learned in terms of inadequacies. And I hate to say this, but I will confess, the last thing we learned in the pandemic is our irrelevance as a profession. And as we watched people break all sorts of medical advice to attend political or religious rallies, or go and look at tall pandas in this city while doctors tore their hair thinking, why don't they listen to us? We realized that for science to succeed in practice, you first need to convince your political masters and have the political will rather than have doctors, medical professionals and science just expound the theories of science. I will not end on a sad note. So on a happier note, I will say that when you're in the 90s in cricket, you have to be circumspect. You have the advantages of having batted for those 90 runs and you have just 10 more to go to reach that target which puts you right on top of the world but you know where you have to go and you know where you have been and since i don't often get invited to 91st birthday parties i will tell you that you have to borrow from cricket this information and work towards those last 10 runs with great care and precision and finally, to conclude, what is the most important lessons we have learned from the pandemic in this life? I think the most important lesson, and I'm sorry for misuse of a statistical jargon, the most important principle we've learned is what I call the odds ratio of life. We have learned that we have to strive and continue in spite of the odds, we have to continue our work and not wait for the odds to end. We have to, in this new odds ratio I define, we have to learn to get even with the odds before the odds can get even with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quantum. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for your illum illuminating talk and wider perspective concerning the pandemic. 
So let us take one short question from the audience. Uh, just due to, we are running out of time. So just one question. How to decompose that the failure uh, was because of the medical reason or social reason, social awareness? I think. I think I, I don't want to derogate or um, allocate, I should say, responsibility to any particular group. I think we failed as a race. And I think we failed as a species. We have taken all precautions. We've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to prevent a third world war, which could disseminate, decimate our race. We have failed to spend that amount of money in research, in virology, in research, in public health as a species. And I'm not referring to a state or a country here. And I think it's a failure on all fronts. Thank you, sir. So please So while neuro, neuro, neurosurgery is his profession, Dr. Chatterjee's passion is debating. His popular figure in the debating fraternity, a trustee of Calcutta debating circle, and anchor a number of leading debates of Kolkata, such as the telegraph debates. May I now request Dr. Chatterjee to moderate the panel discussion on nation building and role of ISI, celebrating 75 years of in India's independence, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. It is my pleasure to introduce our Chief Statistician of India and Secretary Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Dr. G.P. Shamanko, who is online. Prior to his current assignment, Dr. Shamanko was serving as an advisor in the Reserve Bank of India's Department of Statistics and Information Management. We proud that he is an alumnus of our institute. He did his Masters of Statistics instead. From Indian Statistical Institute, and PhD in economics from the University of Mumbai. Welcome you, sir, to this 91st Foundation Day of ISI. We are grateful that in spite of your busy schedule, you have agreed to join us on this very special day of the Institute. Next, I introduce Sri Vivek Debroy the president of Indian Statistical Institute, Society. Vivek Debra is the chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He has made significant contribution to game theory, economic theory income, and social inequalities, poverty, law reforms, railway reforms, and Indology, among others. He has authored several books, paper, and popular articles. Has been consulting editor of several Indian financial newspapers. He has translated many famous Indian epics from Sanskrit to English. Now I request our president to come on the stage and please take your seat. Sir, please. So it is my privilege to introduce Chairman of ISI Council, Dr. Ashok Kumar Lahiri. Dr. Lahiri is a renowned Indian economist. He served as a member of 
15th Finance Commission. Prior to that, he served the 12th Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, reader at the Delhi School of Economics, Chairman of the Bandhan Bank, Executive Director at Asian Development Bank, and Director of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. He had stints with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund as a consultant and senior economist, respectively. May I request our chairman, sir, to come on stage and take your seat, sir, please. Now I am ending over the session to Dr. Chetri. Over to you, sir. I think I'll do it from here. You know, as surgeons, we are used to standing. So if you allow me, I will uh, uh, moderate from here. Also, as a, as a professor of any medical specialty, it is uh, not a very good sign if I'm maskless for too long. And as I'm perfectly audible in, through a mask and I'm used to lecturing to audiences of 300 with my mask on without a microphone, I'm sure you will not have a problem if I wear a mask because I think this just shows that we should all be still aware the pandemic has not yet gone. And like in Julius Caesar, we should tell ourselves, I, the Ides of March have come, but not yet gone. So I think, the first thing I'm going to ask is our panelists to give us their opinion in about maybe five to seven minutes about nation building and the role of ISI. And since we are now used to doing things that are virtual before things that are real, may I first request Dr. Govindo Shamanto, who is uh, an ex-student of this institution, the Chief Statistician of India, the Secretary Minister of Statistics and Program Implementation, to first give us his opinion very briefly on the role of ISI in nation building. Sir, so you're muted, you need to unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Am I audible now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So before I begin, I guess uh, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee will permit me to remove my mask because I'm sitting here alone and I'll uh, begin without masks, okay? So, Honorable C. Vivek Devrajji, Dr. Ashok Lahiriji, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, Professor Sangamitra Bandhavadhyay, Distinguished Professors, Technical Officers, Analysts and Researchers, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen, all members of ISI. A very good afternoon to you all. It gives me immense pleasure to be present with you though virtually today for the Foundation Day of the Indian Statistical Institute. And I'm truly honored for the invitation. Thank you very much. Visiting and revisiting ISI is always exciting for me as it is my alma mater. And I am lucky to have spent a few years in this August Institute for my studies and also research activities in my initial days. As we all know, ISI the Indian Statistical Institute is recognized as an institute of national importance by the 1959 Act of the Parliament, India, Indian Parliament, and it grew out of the statistical laboratory set up by Professor Prasanthya Chandra Mahalanabis in the then Presidency College, Kolkata. Established in 1931, this unique institution of India is one of the oldest institutions focus on statistics. As I said that ISI origin, and all of you know, can be traced back to the statistical laboratory in the Presidency College. And perhaps in 1931, Professor Mohronovich was the only person working at ISI in, at the beginning. And he managed it 
with an annual expenditure of rupees 250, only rupees 250. It gradually grew with the pioneering work of a group of his colleagues, including, I think I'm just taking few names. I'm not here giving the exhaustive list of Professor S.S. Bose, Samarandra Kumar, Kumar Mitra, then uh, James Sengupta, Raj Chandra Bose, K.R. Nayar, Professor Bahadur, Kalyanpur, Professor D.B. Lahiri, Onel Kupar, there are so many. I just to take a few, I just talk a few of the name and who had received training in statistics at the Institute and went on to become a secretary. Uh, sorry, Pitambar Pond. Pitambar Pond, I missed out the name, who had received training in statistics at the Institute, went on to become a secretary to the first Prime Minister of India, Nehru and was a great source of help and support to the institute. As asked by government of India in 1950, ISI designed and planned a comprehensive socio-economic national sample survey covering rural India. The organization named National Sample Survey was founded in 1950 for conducting this survey. The field work was performed by the Directorate of NSS, functioning under the Ministry of Finance, whereas the other tasks, such as planning of the survey, training of the field works, field worker, receive review, data processing, and tabulation, etc., etc., were executed by Indian Statistical Institute. In 1961, the Directorate of NSS started functioning under the Department of Statistics of Government of India, and later in 1971, the design and analysis wing of NSS was shifted from ISI to NSS, or National Sample Survey Organization. ISI had by 1960 60 started establishing special service units in New Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, Mumbai, Hyderabad, to provide consultancy services to business, industry, and government public service organizations in the area of statistical process control, operational research, and industrial engineering. Additionally, Bangalore had a documentation research and training center. And in early 70s, the Delhi and Bangalore units were converted to teaching centers in 2008, ISI Chennai was upgraded to a teaching center, and in 2011, ISI added a new center at in Tejpur. So I just thought, because as a student of ISI, and if, uh, seeing this, it is so much, uh, I'm very happy to see all this uh, development because many of the things happened after my, uh, when I left ISI, it was in 1990. So after that, more than three decades passed, and ISI continued to grow and uh, uh, to make its presence felt in different forums and different places. As we know in Sanskrit phrase, Bhinnasya Kasya Darsanam, which literally means the philosophy of unity in diversity, and that is incorporated in the logo of the Institute and is the motto of Indian Statistical Institute. Now, what are the contributions made by the researchers at ISI over the years? I just read somewhere, few of them I am summarizing here. Many fundamental contributions they really made in various fields of statistics, such as, and, and statistics and related areas, such as design of experiments, sample survey, multivariate statistics, and computer science. Moronovich himself introduced the measure of Moronovich distance which is used in multivariate statistics and other related fields, including pattern recognition and those areas. Professor Raj Chandra Bose, who is known for his contribution in coding theory, worked on design of experiments during his tenure at ISI and was one of the three mathematicians who disproved the Euler's conjecture on orthogonal Latin squares. Professor Anil Kumar Bhattacharya is credited with introduction of measures such as Bhattacharya distance, Bhattacharya coefficient, etc. So I can go on 
and waiting and of course few thereafter was professor c r rao's contributions during his association with isi two famous theorem in on of statistical inference known as popularly known as kramer rao inequality and rao blackwell theorem and introduction of orthogonal arrays in design of experiments also his contribution professor anil kumar gain is known for his contributions to the pearson product moment correlation coefficients with his colleague sir ronald fisher at the university of cambridge please pardon me i am i'm sure i have missed out many of the interesting contribution and fundamental work done by isi professors researchers or at isi in 1959 53 india's first indigenous computer was designed by professor samarendra kumar mitra who headed the computing machines and electronics laboratory at isi kolkata so indian statistical institute was also host, uh, hosted the first two digital computers in south asia i think they are called hcc 2m from england in 1956 and the ural from the soviet union in 1959 these were also among the early digital computers in asia outside japan during 53 56 distinguished scientists like <coughs> ronald fisher norbert weiner uri linnik visited isi weiner collaborated with kolyanpur gopinath kolyanpur on topics including ergodic theory prediction theory generalized harmonic analysis in 1962 during his month long visit to isi soviet mathematician andrew kolmogorov wrote his notable paper on kolmogorov complexity which was published in sankhya in 1963 Other distinguished scientists, including Jerry Neyman, Walter Swartz, W. Edward Deming, Abraham Wall, and many more, have visited ISI during the tenure of P.C. Morano Mission thereafter. About ten years from now, ISI is going to celebrate its centenary year. A nine decades of nine decades of eventful journey and its association. in the process of nation building gives the institute a region for glory and pride over the years as we know policy making and decisions are increasingly becoming more information based and data driven and this is where lies the importance of data information knowledge and wisdom pyramid so policy today many policy The requirements are same like earlier some are new many of the cases requirements even though it is same as earlier but the solution may not be identical data sources changing nature of the data changing type of the data changing information base changing but what we need is continuous basis we need to evolve and we have to develop the we have we need to continue to remain the innovative in terms of producing new theorems and also in terms of giving demonstration of their application which can really help in the policy making and also decision making i think new kind of economic activities are emerging out technological progress also happening so contribution towards welfare gain and policy making for the nation i hope would remain at the core of indian statistical institute's objective so because it is a statistical institute only one perhaps one of the first in the in the, in the country so over the period of your know, near future i hope that isi would devote and develop more statistical to make and the methods technology around this so that its contribution is really felt more meaningfully and also you know, more wider applicable application point of view it gets the attention by the policy makers and also by the <clears throat> researchers and analysts so being an institution of national importance i definitely hope isi makes 
significant contribution and continue to make significant contribution the like the way it did in the past and and also it really helped and it become a instruments to really build our nation on and i wish today i could personally be present this day in in kolkata for the event but i'm somehow missing the pulse of the or this kind of celebration or this occasion where it is not just a celebration we are actually reminding it remind us of our past glorious history of ahsai and also make us more responsible to continue or to remain in the same position in future so we need to be more responsible we need to be more sincere we need to be more focused in terms of our activity and the uh, um, research and analysis so i think with this brief note i think once again i'm thank you all of you for um, giving me this opportunity joy hind for taking us in a journey through the glorious pages of history of this great institute uh, can we bring in sri Vivek Devroy for his comments please about the role of ISI in nation building. Thank you, Dr. Kanji, the chairman, the Kanji Bhairi, and the chief statistician, the director, the deputy director, faculty, staff, students. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I must confess that the chapter when I heard the introduction, I was somewhat worried because I was worried that you try to provoke a debate between me and my dear friends Ashok Lahiri and Dr. Samun. But in a classic debating format, you're not supposed to read. <laughs> Since you have allowed that deviation, <laughs> I presume this is not a debate, and this is, as the program suggests, a panel discussion. I had the benefit of listening in on some of the comments that were made in the earlier session, and almost everything that can be said, almost everything that needs to be said, has already been said. The only value addition I can impart is by perhaps restating the problem in a slightly different context. Foundation Day, 17 December, 90 years ago, 17 December, 19. Why 17%? Why 17? Why not 16? Why not 18? We know that meeting happened on the 17th of December, or 17th of December in Presidency College. And it might have been pure chance that that meeting occurred on the 17th of December rather than the 16th of the night. I doubt very much that PCM, as all quizzers know, 17th December is also famous for the first flight of the Wright brothers in 1903, but I doubt very much that PCM chose that as a test. 17th December in 1931 happened to be Poila Bush. And I think that is the reason he chose that particular date. And unless I've got my Bengali calendars completely messed up, today also happens to be Poil You need whatever imagery you want to read into that. The month of Posh figures in literature. In the earlier session, people quoted Tagore, it features in Tagore's poems and songs. <coughs> In the works of others also, 
it has special auspicious significance. And it is also the advent of winter. The two winter seasons begin with the spoiler ocean. And I cannot but resist. Quote a proverb immortalized by Shelley, which said that if winter comes, it can spring me far behind. So, yes, Bosch is the advent of winter. Bosch brings the chill. We feel the chill. Kintu Bosch marsh mani je shorbona In the earlier session, someone mentioned Alice. There is this bit where Alice meets, comes to a fork in the road. And there is a Cheshire cat sitting on a tree. And in the course of the conversation, the Cheshire cat asks Alice, where do you want to go? Alice says, I don't know. And the Cheshire cat says, in that case, it does not matter which fork you choose. I think for our side, to paraphrase Dr. Chatterjee's expression, in the nervous night, it is important, important to ask, where do we want to go? Yes, there is this glorious tradition. Yes, there is this legacy. But where do we want to go? Make no mistake. ISR represents stellar contributions widely recognized nationally and globally by individual faculty members. But an aggregation of the individual does not essentially add up to a collective content. Notwithstanding the remarkable achievements of individual faculty members and ex students, notwithstanding the excellence of the BSTAT program, what is the collective identity of the Indian statistical institute? Where do we go in the next 10 years to achieve that century? And very quickly, I think that there are questions that need to be asked about each of those three terms, Indian, statistical, and history. Indian definitionally means it needs to have all India representation, all India presence, all India policy level in. All India representation in faculty and in students. Statistics means we need to think about what we mean by the word statistics. Yes, the core will always be statistics. But is it theoretical statistics? Is it more of applications? And when we think about the institute, for any institute, any organization, there are certain issues that are critical. The first issue is HR, recruiting faculty, and ISI happens to be in a state which faculty members do not always find very attractive. And lest I be misunderstood, let me personalize this and state that both Dr. Ashok Lahiri and I represent human capital flight from West. So there is HR, there is finance, raising resources, and there are governance issues. Again, if I have not misunderstood in the days of PCM in terms of the governance structure, what we had was a bit like a unitary governance structure. The governance structure required today needs to be much more federal as long as I am not misunderstood in my use of words. Let us also recognize that historically, ISI has been a bit of a minor. Part of the entire survey work has gone away. But wherever that vestige of a monopoly remains, there is the threat of new entry. 
this discovery of the new identity which is not a denial of the old identity is best done internally an external review to which there was a reference totally triggers the thought process the compulsions the drive the strategy the new vision the new vision the target the trajectory all of that has to be determined essentially internally autonomous body what is an autonomous body what is the definition of an autonomous body an autonomous body is self ruling that is the definition of autonomy what does it mean in the context of the national education policy for 2030 i can claim to be autonomous if i am self financed the moment i receive a grant from any government I cannot be truly, truly autonomous because anyone who gives me money has the right to ask, "What are you delivering? What is it that I am getting in return?" And hence the question: What kind of policy inputs am I getting? Are those policy inputs useful? I am not getting into the answer to the question. I am just making the point: One cannot question. The funders' right to ask that question. Seventy-fifth Amrit Mahotsav. As everyone present here knows, Amrit arose as a result of the churning of the ocean, Samudra. In the course of the churning of the ocean, Alahal and poison was also. But fourteen different treasures also surfaced, including Amrit. And I think once we do this internal check, we will come up with a strategy, with a direction, with an identity that leads ISI to greater heights and the discovery of that pot of Amrit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Debroy. I think after this amazing speech with this amazing vision, there can be very little debates that can be stirred after that, and I can assure you there will be none. However, I, I may, with all humility, take a little quarrel with your describing yourself and as an example of human capital flight, because if you flee from an institution of national importance to another part of the country, that's national dissemination rather than human capital flight. And I think the institute should be honoured that it has people that have spread to different parts of this country where they still uphold the standards of this institute. And I, I, I may just take thirty seconds and tell you that just a few months ago, I was in another institute just not far away from here, the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. Where the director made a similar speech, and then uh, because I am a faculty in one of their courses, and then went out and showed me the foundation stone that our late Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru laid at the IIT Kharagpur. He's and it, on it is written the words, "Dedicated to the service of the nation." And the director of IIT told me, unfortunately, our late Prime Minister forgot to mention which nation. So seventy percent of our students are now in North America. <laughs> On that note, I think we will bring in Dr. Ashok Lahiri, Chairman of your Council. Dr. Lahiri. Thank you, Professor Jaski, President Debroy, Director Ondupadkai, Director Patti, staff, and students. So after this uh, extensive discussion today in the earlier sessions as well as by Dr. Shamanpur and Vivek. I'll just say that what a journey it has been for ISI in the last nine years. It is difficult to read any serious book on the Indian economic development or social economic problems where ISI is at the past. The it's almost like the first tree that ISI was set up in 1930s to be ready by the time India got independence to hit the ground running. 
the all over the world, there is not much knowledge about this fiction that I said was set up. James Mead and Richard Stone in Britain and Simon Kuznets in the US, all three got the wealth prizes of people. And Colin Clark was also. They're grappling with the problem of national accounts. There was no national accounts. The first formal national accounts came out in the United States in 1947. And what happened in India? ISI was already in its teens when India got independence. And there was a committee that was set up, brought the national accounts in 1951, I think, and 1949. Uh, yeah, 1949. And who was the chairman of the committee? It was our founder, director, Trump. And the two other members were also very distinguished. One was Professor T.R. Gatsby of the uh, Oakley Institute. And the other was Dr. B.K.R. Rao, the future founder of the Institute. Now, the ISI has a brilliant history, not only in terms of national contribution, but it has produced and merger. Dr. Shamukha has already told us. Indian talents like C.R. Rao, R.C. Bose, S.R. Srinivasa Varadhan, Raghuraj Bahadur, and many more. And it has been visited by the best writers in the world, like Old Mogoro, Novel Fisher, and J.B. Solomon. I shall not dwell on the ISI's past contribution, but I cannot resist telling you a story that C.R. Rao, one of our, again, a distinguished director, he was in one of the econometric conferences. If I'm not mistaken, to the view of him, he was chatting with us. And this has got nothing to do with measure theory or design of experiments. Maybe it has got something with design of experiments. He told us that there was a problem in post partition days. There many of these guys who were very worried about the security and had taken shelter into their food. They had to be supplied food, and contractors were billing for the supply. Now, how do you estimate? You can't, it's too risky to go in, and you have to estimate how much is there, how many people is there. And lo and behold, Dr. Rao said, we found a very simple way. You can be invoiced for salt and find out the per capita consumption of salt, and you can get the number of people inside. Now, let me not dwell on the past, but get on to the future. Professor Chatterjee has already told us that we are in nervous 90s and we cannot sort of be complacent. We need to look at how we chart our future. And it is an enormous challenge. Why is it an enormous challenge? It is an enormous challenge because ISI has got a brilliant history. And ISI is doing well. It's not that ISI is doing bad. We are proud of our professors and alumni for the continuing seminal contribution to the field of knowledge. For example, I had a small talk with the director. Out of the four Indians who have got the Ramanita, Prize for young mathematicians from developing countries since 2004. Three are our professors or talents. Reforming an institution is unnecessary when it's doing well. You are not in the ICU or you are not even in the hospital. Why go to a doctor? Find out what we should do. But that is a very myopic view. We need to look at not only retrospectively how we have done in the past or how we are doing in the present, but we need to look at the future and see what we need to do to keep it up. Just looking at the past and just because we are doing okay doesn't mean we don't need to change. Furthermore, we need to bend the roof when the sun is shining. We don't want to repair the roof when it's already leaking and it's raining outside. We need to do it now. The 
I believe an institute is a living organism. Your wisdom increases with age. I know that since I'm getting old. But you also know that there are problems of age. And you need to rejuvenate yourself to keep up with the race. We are fortunate that we have a report of the old review, which is drawn up by very eminent. And we also know they have the best interests of the institute in mind. And uh, the key to success will lie in how far we can contend with the problems of aging and changing of the times. The review comes to the report to be very useful. The report has recommended very many steps that the ISI should take to not only compete with its own past accomplishments. But also contribute more to nation building. We at the ISI Council are very carefully deliberating on it. Hopefully, we will be able to give our considered views and starting our journey on a new path in the near future. That's the assurance that I want to give you, to Debroy, and second to Shamanpur, and all of you that will engage with it and will come out with our best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And thank you for ending on such a positive note. You know, the first day that postdoctorate students come to my department, I always tell them that a good student is one who answers questions. A better student is one who questions answers. And the best student is one who questions the questions themselves. And on that note, I now invite the audience to ask our eminent faculty any particular questions, just to make it a little interactive. So if you have any questions or any clarifications that you'd like to seek, provided they're parliamentarily acceptable, you may uh, ask the questions to the eminent panelists. Can we have uh, somebody from the audience? There's a young lady here who wishes to ask a question. You, you need a... She's got a microphone in her hand, but I'm... Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, my humble submission, Deborah, Chatterjee, ISI's problem, since I'm also old in ISI now, uh, is perhaps a recognition of different disciplines, uh, some sort of symbiotic relation, which has not been developed. Partially, because you see, if you look at the North American experiment or European or experiment, where there have been huge funding for non-statistics uh, sort of subjects. Uh, that didn't happen in India. So it was some sort of grant-driven development in North America where interdisciplinary sort of uh, you know, research and, and academic activity started, but it didn't happen in India. Coming to ISI, I think statistics grew in, in, when, when it started with statistics and the growth of other stuff, let's say it's uh, asymmetry of information, it might be uh, 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 non-interest about subjects and non-information about biology, geology, physics, and so on. So this didn't happen in ISI. And that is some sort of external to ISI and not internal to us. So the symbiotic relation often is misunderstood as is given in the review committee report. It's external to ISI. ISI in its unique way has tried to develop several disciplines and statisticians or in the computing part, where huge data was generated and through technology development, computer science view, this understanding could not develop. So some sort of intrinsic development of the subjects have uh, really created a comprehensive, uh, though a little bit compartmentalized, but I should say end of the day, it's holistic and uniqueness of ISI, which is often misunderstood by academia, often misunderstood in the country, 
but well understood in the international scene. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that, Mr. Devroy? That sounded more like a comment rather than a question. But I will respond. And I will tag this to something that was said <laughs> about my interest in doing Some of you may know that I was the chairman of the committee that was set up to examine the reform of the Indian railways. And many of the railway reform recommendations that are now being implemented are based on that committee's report. <laughs> And I'm still roundly abused sometimes, not always, for those recommendations. What I wanted to point out is every recommendation in that report came from within the railway system. We asked people in the railways, what do you think should be done about the railways? Your future, your stake is in the railways. And someone or the other came up with an answer, which eventually we structured into the report. There were perhaps 10% of railway people who said everything is hunky dory. We do not need to change. We do not recognize that there is a threat to the railway because of road transport and air transport. The external observer could see it. 90% of railwaymen could see it. There were 10% who could not see it. I'm using this analogy to reinforce a point made by the chairman. Perhaps all is well, but I doubt it very much. There is no organization where all is well. And I repeat what I said earlier, that the best source of change is when it is internal. Let that internal process begin instead of maligning the external. The Oracle of Delphi and our sacred texts all said look inwards. So please look inwards. I refuse to believe in any organization, everything's broken. Thank you, sir. I think uh, the father of the nation also told us, be the change you want to see in this world. So I think that's uh, what Mr. Debra is referring to. Mr. Dr. Lahi, do you want to uh, make a comment on this? I think uh, De Broy has already answered. I normally say that I can't change the wind. I can only trim my sails. So even if what you're saying is right, since I can't change India and the world, I can only adapt myself and try to be, do the very best that I can. The, one of the questions raised was about interdisciplinary work. Do you think that is lacking? Interdisciplinary work, again, I sense it, it's not sub duties, but it's being discussed in the council by all my deeds. I don't want to go deep into it, but there is some restructuring that the review committee has recommended. And we're going to the pros and cons of they must have applied their minds very seriously to the structure. And interdisciplinary work, since I also have a trained economic academic at some point in time, in academic institutions, it also depends on interpersonal relationships. Move a coffee here, you go for lunch, and you're talking to a professor. I remember when I was in the School of Economics, a professor of zoology came to me. I used to do some econometrics a long time ago. Don't ask me questions to professors on econometrics now. So he asked me some key test for type 12 test was there. I said that I even got technology. So in, in many academic institutions, what happens is over dinner or over coffee, you're discussing something and you strike the call. So unfortunately, Nisa, that tradition is very much there. And I find that two professors sitting, they belong to different departments. I think the future is very bright in terms of research. I, I will also mention, I think it was Professor Shonga Das, Ghosh. 
he mentioned the point which was seconded by Professor Chatterjee that in this pandemic today, Professor Ghosh said that this COVID-19 caught us with our pants down. I won't go to that extent, but it's all for you, very bright and brilliant social scientists and statisticians to ask this question. Is Shrodov right? Is Mr. Shrondi Charity right? that we faced this pandemic, and if we did, then as chairman of ISI, I cannot but accept responsibility that we did. That's an important question to ask, and as Vivek pointed out, it was raised by not outsiders, it was raised by one of our professors. Thank you. You will be happy to know, sir, that uh... Even though I spend my time in a small hospital doing brain and spine surgery, I have have collaborators in this institute uh, with whom I have been working. So even there is some collaboration with neurosurgery, then you can well understand you're going well beyond uh, the remits of this institute. That's fantastic. Any other questions or comments or anybody would like to They say that the human brain, even in the as it, in, in its state in the mother's womb, makes noises. And this continues throughout our life till the first time we are asked to hold a microphone and stand up and speak. And then we realize that it is not true. So shed your inhibition and ask the question. Yes, sir. So, reference You just need to hold that microphone closer to your face. So, with reference to the symbiotic relationship that Dr. Uh, Mukta just mentioned, uh, the second question, and also you define the, the autonomy and uh, the grand in to refer to that thing also. So uh, for the lesson building, I think uh, also you already pointed out that we need to have a planning and implementation, implementation also. And for the implementation purposes, uh, I would like to uh, know your view that we need to have a coherent relationship between the institution and the government. And your uh, views on the existing the coherent relationship and you know how it is going to help uh, for the autonomous institution across the country, uh, the particular relationship to have a, you know, uh, role in medicine. Since the review committee has also highlighted this, and since as the chairman mentioned, the council is considering it, I will sidestep the question and answer it a little bit differently. I did not use the expression grounds. I am married. So the moment we decide to get married, we lose a little bit of our body. It's a conscious decision to get married, recognizing that we lose our body. If I want full autonomy, I do not get married. If I ask resources from anyone, whether it is the government, whether it is the union government, whether it is the state government, whether it is the private sector, the grantor of it, and I'm not using the word grant, the grantor of it is within his or her rights to ask. What will you give me? There is no morality about it because this is perfectly moral. If I want to be tautologically, if I want to be fully autonomous, I should say I am completely self-relaxed. Moment I am not, 
I'm definitely doing them not podcasts. And I need to quickly point out that although ISI is not in the same bracket, the union government set up a committee to review autonomous institutions, of which I repeat, ISI was not, and closed down several. Maybe while talking about the relationship between the institution and the government, we should bring Dr. Shamunta in. Do you want to comment on this question, Dr. Shamunta, about the relationship of this institute with the government? I, I think I missed out the question raised from the audience. It is not audible to me, even, even the earlier cases also. But I could hear what Professor... Uh, uh, President and chairmen, both of them said. And I think this is a thing as both of them said that autonomy and other things, I, I don't know whether anything recommending came from the funding point of view. I'm not very sure that exact question. So I'm not sure whether I'm out of context, whatever I'm making a comment here or statement here, because question is not known. I'm just trying to make an input. The issue here is, I think also they talked about review committee report. Am I right? Review committee report also they mentioned about. Yes, that's correct. I think it is at the end of ISI at this stage. And I have not received any comment of ISI on this matter. So it may not be right at this stage really to have a comment on review committee and its recommendation because ISI is looking into it. That is my understanding. And in terms of the funding and other things, there is a systematic process and it is age old process. Depending upon the need, it is fine tuned whenever it is needed. So I don't see any issue there as, of, as far as the relationship between government of India and ISI is concerned. Unless ISI raise any specific issue, I think it is very smooth and good. A brief comment. I, of course, I could not hear the exact question. One of the great things about people in the ministry is that they can answer correctly without hearing the question. And so you've actually answered perfectly. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, go on. My question is to just we have gone parallel with the churning of ocean and so when churning of ocean took place, then both the nectar as well as the poison came out. Now, uh, as far as this illustration is concerned, how can it be uh, demonstrated well with respect to ISI? <laughs> I think I already answered this question. The ocean was jointly churned by people who are perceived to be devas and also people who are perceived to be asuras. But they jointly churned it and eventually led to something productive. And as I said, that part thing will primarily have to come in general. I may, with your permission, I may add, and I always maintain that the stabilizing a status quo the status quo is very comfortable. I'm doing this every day. Don't ask me to change those. Now, destabilizing the status quo will lead to that by Pan and Vishangara. There will be some poison that will come. But again, to stay alive and to prosper, you have to destabilize. And you have to destabilize the status quo when it's not an emergency. It's not that I'm rushing to, you're rushing me to Dr. Chatterjee's neurosurgeon to get a brain surgery. Get it stalled before it starts. So Amrit and Bish, this is the status quo destabilization result. Changing, change is always, change is always true. So there will be something. Everything, as you know, is a matter of perception. Just to put in to answer your question about Amrit and Bish. You know, you know when uh, what is Bish was taken by the Asuras, as Mr. Devroy said, 
we said there were asuras who were consuming it, who were going to now reach meet their fate, which they deserved. When Lord Shiva consumed it, we called him Neil Conto because that beast stayed in his gullet, as it were. So it's all a matter of perception as how we see the world. And just to tell you about a small little thing about an inscription, which is written on the walls of probably one of the oldest Greek temples, not very far away from the city of Delphi. There is a very ancient Greek temple, which was originally supposed to be a center of medical learning. And on it is written the words, naughty Zeuton, which means know thyself. And this is the motto to the physicians of ancient Greece. First know yourself, and then you can correct yourself. Right, I'm just, uh, is, is there any other question? If not, I'm just going to ask one final question to each of the panelists to answer very briefly while we round up. Am I? Uh, I should not be, absolutely, but it's a very easy question, so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to ask you anything about brain surgery. Um, and the question is, to each one of you, uh, because you are very eminent people in every possible way, uh, and that is, tell me one way you would like this institute to be different from what it is now in the next 10 years, which would lead to a glorious centenary. So what one change would you suggest this institute have in the next 10 years? And I'm going to start off with Dr. Shamunto, if I can get you in. One change you would like to see in the next 10 years to bring you to a glorious century. Yeah, I think my answer is in your question itself, because you are saying you want to see this institute different, so recommend it has to change, otherwise it cannot be different. Okay, so otherwise it will remain identical if it doesn't change. The question I'm saying is, I think, uh, also taking clue from the earlier answer on the question, audience from uh, both my ex uh, esteemed uh, panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Vivek Debra and also Lahiriji. I think change is essential for development, but every change is not development. ISI should look into at what time, what sort of change is needed so that that is contributing to the lessons. And that will establish or re-establish or make it uh, whatever already the glory they have, it will be taking further heights to help achieve the further heights. So timely change is needed, but every change is not the development. So they should have a focus so that accordingly they change. I think this simple thing I'm just trying to say. Thank you, Mr. Debroy. We know that ISI has traveled down this glorious road for 90 years. But there is a road that lies ahead. ISI needs to look at the road that lies ahead. And we cannot drive along that road ahead while one constantly looks at the way we are. Dr. Lairi, do you have the last word? As well you, I have been coming to this institute from 1968 when I was a graduate BA student in Presence. And then I came here attending conferences. I've been taught by professors of this institute, School of Economics, as well as in Delhi campus. So I consider myself part of this institute. Now they have no choice. <laughs> Great. On that wonderful note, it only rests on me to thank our panelists today, Dr. Shamunto, Shivibek Devroy, and Dr. Ashok Lahiri. 
thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you in the last hour. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you our eminent panelists for a excellent discussion. We are uh, looking for our uh, centenary to uh, grow further. So on behalf of the Institute, uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, Dr. Samanto, President Vivek Debroy, and Chairman Sir, Dr. Lahiri, to accept our inv invitation and participating on this panel discussion. Now it's time to uh, felicitate all our dignitaries, all our panelists. So Dr. Samanto is uh, online. So we express our appreciation to Dr. Samanto. Uh, now we felicitate our uh, panelists. So may I now request our students, Anish, Sucheta, and Shomodip to come over the stage uh, to felicitate our panelists. Please come. So first I uh, call Shomodip to felicitate our distinguished guest, Dr. Sundeep Chatterjee. Sir, please come in. Okay, 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 definitely. Please, one by one. Sir, please come in the center. <laughs> so Anish, please come. Ah, yeah. Start with uh, Dr. Chatterjee. I request Anish to uh, President Sir, Sri Vivek Devraj. Now I request Sucheta to felicitate our Chairman Sir, Dr. Lahiri. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, um, so we have uh, almost uh, uh, reached at the end of this uh, function. Uh, thank you all for attending this function. I'm just declare the closing of this function with the national anthem. Please rise all uh, for the national anthem. I'm <laughs> <laughs>